thank you for joining our online service in Living Word IT Park. You may join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. for our English service. You may also give your love offering through online bank transfer or over-the-counter direct deposit. Bank details are shown on the screen. A servant of Christ, serving as Dean of Cebu Graduate School of Theology, CGST, Vice President of Baptist Theological College, BTC, and President of Bethlehem Star of Peace, BSOP, a mission sending agency, been married to Daryl since 2003 and blessed with two children, Thea, who is seven, and Sam, who is two. To my brethren at Living Word IT Park Church, good morning, Pastor TJ and the rest of the leadership team and whoever is watching right now, good morning to one and all. I am grateful for this opportunity God has given me so that I can share this video message to all of you and let's hope that the Lord is glorified and everybody will be edified as we meditate on God's word together this morning. Now, how many of you consider yourself to be a religious person. You don't have to raise your hand because I cannot see you, but I believe generally speaking, Filipinos are known to be religious people, right? You can see a lot of religious stuff, religious symbols in the houses or, uh, you know, in schools or workplaces, even in cars. And uh, some, we find them at government offices. But here are some questions I'd like us to answer. Is it possible that people who are so religious outwardly, but barren inwardly or unfruitful inwardly. Is it possible for people to have all of these religious stuff at home and yet there is no real transformation in the heart? And is it, is, is it possible to be so religious but not saved? Now, if you listened to Pastor TJ's sermon last week, you know the answer to these questions. That sermon and the fig tree episode informed us not only about God's judgment on Jerusalem and its temple, it also reminded us that the Lord Jesus Christ wants fruitfulness in the lives of the Jewish people and in the lives of his disciples. And by the grace of God, I believe that the Living Word IT Park Church is committed to disciple men and women so that everybody will be fruitful in Jesus Christ both inwardly and outwardly. Amen? I hope you said amen to that. Now, this sermon is a continuation of the passage preached last Sunday. We will be meditating on what it means to have faith in God, which is based on Mark chapter 11, starting from verse 20 up to 33. So I'd like to invite everyone to read this passage with me in the English Standard Version. Again, Mark 11, 20 up to verse 33. And here's what God's word says. Verse 20. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in the heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Verse 25, whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. And they came again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question, answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why didn't you not believe him? 
What shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We don't know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Now may God bless the reading and the hearing of his word. Let us pause for, for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that this portion of the scripture has been preserved for us and thank you that we have this time that we can meditate as a church the meaning and the message that you want us to learn from this sermon, from this passage. And so we entrust to you our meditation together. We pray that again you will be glorified in this and everybody listening or watching right now will be built up, edified. This is for your glory and this is for the benefit of your church. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Now what we see in this passage, brothers and sisters, is that aside from the fruitfulness that Jesus requires from his people, one of the primary lessons that Jesus wants his disciples to learn from this withered fig tree is for all of them to have faith in God. The Lord Jesus is looking for followers who have a genuine faith in God. And so as we listen to this sermon this morning, I'd like all of us to evaluate ourselves and see for ourselves if we truly have this kind of faith that Jesus is talking about here. You know, it's one thing to claim to have faith in God, but it's another thing to demonstrate that faith as God intends. So Mark, Mark said in verse 20, look at verse 20, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots, totally destroyed, totally dead. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. You know, friends, there's actually a fig tree in front of our house. And a few years back, one of the faculty, uh, one of the teachers we have at the Bible College planted that. And right now, I, I checked it this week, <laughs> the fig tree only has a few leaves and zero fruit. So what should I do with it? Don't worry, I, I'm not going to curse that fig tree. Now let's go back to this, this passage. Peter said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. And Jesus immediately gave them this profound lesson. And what is that? He said, have faith in God, verse 22. And so he used the incident as a lesson on faith in God. And friends, this is the same lesson that God wants us to meditate upon today. That God or Jesus wants us to learn today. Have faith in God. So you need to ask yourself this question. Do I really have this faith in God. What kind of faith is this? Looking at the larger context, we know that Jesus is talking about a genuine faith, not a hypocritical faith. He's looking for a faithful, fruitful faith, not a barren faith. The object of this faith is God himself, not the temple, not Jerusalem, not the religious leaders, not even faith itself. And this is the kind of faith that the leaders in Jerusalem lacked. And we know that this is the kind of faith that pleases God. And so that's a, a, in a larger context here. But looking at the passage itself, what kind of faith is this? In our passage, there are at least three things that I'd like to highlight when it comes to this faith. First of all, this is a kind of faith that is unwavering that boldly asks God to accomplish what is humanly impossible. Second, this is a kind of faith that obeys God's policy on forgiveness. And third, this is a kind of faith that accepts and submits to God's authority over all things. And so these are the three aspects of this faith that I'd like to expand in this sermon today. So when Jesus said, have faith in God, first of all, he's looking for an unwavering faith that boldly asks God to accomplish what is humanly impossible. You see, Jesus used power in cursing the fig tree. That's why it withered right away and totally. 
And he's telling his disciples here that they can also tap that power from God so that they can achieve the impossible through faith in God. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, it's like his, his, his way of saying, this is not fake news. You can trust him on this. He said, truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what God, what, what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I, I, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. You see, this is a picture of a bold, unwavering faith. Jesus said, does not doubt in the heart. And we need to understand what Jesus is saying here so that we know if we have this kind of faith or not. Now, take note. The image of throwing a mountain into the sea is figurative. This is not to be taken literally. I don't want us to go out right now and tell Mount Manungal in Balamban, Go throw yourself into the sea. Aside from the ECQ rules that prohibit us from going there, it's also not how this passage should be interpreted. Or else there will be major topographical changes in the world should Christians literally do this. Mount Mayun, Mount Everest, go throw yourselves into the sea. That's not how this works. Now many scholars agree that the image of throwing a mountain into the sea is figurative for something that is humanly impossible. So what Jesus is saying here is that the greatest possible difficulties, like mountains, can be removed when a person has faith in God. And God is the source of power, not your faith. It is God, the object, the source of power. In other words, dependent trust in God can accomplish humanly impossible things through prayer. So what we pray for as Christians reveals whether we have this kind of faith or not. What we pray for reveals whether we have this kind of faith or not. Living Word churches are known as churches that pray. You have regular prayer and fasting throughout the year. So continue to do that humbly, faithfully, and obediently. And I heard from my colleague, Dr. Stephen Guest, that you have some kind of a prayer chain. And that's really good. Keep on doing that. But I wondered, brothers and sisters, in those corporate prayer and fasting events, what kind of things are you asking God for? What kind of things are you asking God for? Are you asking God to enable you to, to, to throw your mountains into the sea? Or are you asking God corporately to help you achieve the impossible by His power working in and through you? Whatever your vision is as a church, as you seek to help advance the gospel of Christ in Ivy Park and beyond, what massive mountains are you facing right now as a faith community? If you have plans of expanding beyond Cebu, what kind of mountains do you want to be thrown into the sea so that God's purposes are accomplished in and through you? We're not looking for things that will only benefit oneself. Friends, this is not the name it, claim it kind of faith. This is not about us. This is about the Lord Jesus and His kingdom work on earth. He's looking at Living Word Church right now to see if you truly have this kind of faith in His power to achieve the impossible among you as you fulfill the vision that God has given you for this church. We are facing a massive mountain right now, this COVID-19 pandemic. And we know that without God's intervention, it will be stopped. Our mayor, Mayor Labellia, on April 15, he said this, we are hoping that a miracle will happen and we can lift the ECQ on April 28. Friends, this crisis has not made us inutile, right? If it's God's expertise, to do what is humanly impossible. So let's continue to implore heaven and believe that God will end this pandemic 
in time. Only God can do it. Only God can do the impossible. Now, for some of you in your personal situation, you may feel that your marital problems are impossible to solve. You desperately need a miracle from God so that your husband or your wife will be changed for the better. Others may think that their dear loved ones are impossible to be saved because of so many factors. Friends, as we continue to follow Jesus, remember this, that dependent trust in God can accomplish humanly impossible things through prayer. Through prayer. You see, the church that prays together will experience God's power together. As this scholar R.P. Franz asserted, for those who have faith, he said, the impossible is achievable. Why? If you look at what Paul said, why the impossible is achievable? Because our faith, brothers and sisters, is anchored in the one who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to the power that is at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. So brothers and sisters at Living Word IP Power Church, continue to express this faith in God by asking Him to accomplish what is humanly impossible in and through you. Now, aside from the faith that believes in God's power, this is also the kind of faith that obeys God's policy on forgiveness. It's faith in God's forgiveness. In verse 25, Jesus said, and when you stand praying, of course, praying is a good thing, right? Yeah, it's good to pray. Anybody can do that. Standing in prayer is visible. Many people can see you when you pray standing. But what people cannot see is what happens in the heart. What is that? Jesus continued. If you, meaning you, Christ disciples, you, Living Word Church, if you believe that you have faith in God, you are in Christ. If you hold anything against anyone, that's what's happening in the heart. You hold a grudge or anything, an offense in your heart, against another person, anyone, it could be your spouse, it could be your father or mother, it could be your sibling, you know, it could be your pastor. Some, some members, they have any, something against their pastor in their heart. So what did Jesus command here? He said, forgive them, forgive them. Why? It says, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Friends, this is Jesus talking here. This is God's policy on forgiveness. This is something that is so easy to say, forgive them, but it's very difficult for many people, even Christians, to do. There are no ifs, there are no when, but just plain forgive, forgive them. The same message is communicated by Jesus as recorded by Matthew, in chapter 6 of Matthew, it is what Matthew recorded for, if you forgive others, Jesus is saying here, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So what is Jesus doing in here? Jesus wants to emphasize the importance of avoiding broken relationships within the disciple community. He wants to ensure that everyone in the Christian community was aware that forgiveness of other people was not just a prerequisite for one's own sins to be forgiven, but it is also a prerequisite for effective prayer. It would be hypocritical on our part to expect God to graciously forgive us when we ask for forgiveness but we cannot extend the same grace to others. So here's my question for all of us. Is there someone in your life whom you have not forgiven yet? Do you have someone in your heart whom you have not forgiven yet? What do you mean by forgiveness? 
Forgiveness here means in your heart, you release that person from guilt. Release that person from guilt and reestablish the relationship if possible. I said if possible because I know that there could be other complex factors why it may not be possible to reestablish the relationship like before. But at least in your heart, you have released that person. You have forgiven that person from his or her guilt. And once forgiven, what do we do? You will not use that person's offense against that person anymore. That's real forgiveness. Now, I may not know your specific situation right now. I may, I may not know how things happen between you and that person. But Jesus and the Heavenly Father know. They know exactly what happened. And if you really believe in what Jesus is saying here, if you really have faith in God, then you will obey what he's asking you to do right now. We don't have to wait till the ECQ is lifted before we reach out to that person and release our forgiveness to that person. We can just do it right now. You can probably text or, or chat on Messenger and, and just and, and, and solve this problem. And so the warning we get from Jesus' words here is that if we don't obey this, if we don't forgive others, the Heavenly Father will not forgive us. And it will affect the effectiveness of our prayer as well. So again, what kind of faith is this? It's a faith that trusts in God to do what is humanly impossible. And it's a kind of faith that obeys God's policy on forgiveness. And third, it's the kind of faith that accepts and submits to God's authority in all things. It accepts, it submits to God's authority in all things. Let's proceed to verses 27 through 30, 33. In that section, we read about this tense encounter between Jesus and the chief priests, scribes, and the elders in the temple. I call this episode the encounter between the Sanhedrin and the sovereign. Of course, we know who the sovereign is. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And at this point, Jesus was actually challenging the massive mountain of tradition and the entrenched power in Jerusalem with what he's doing and what he's teaching. And if you don't know what the Sanhedrin was, the Sanhedrin was actually the ruling elite composed of the chief priests, the scribes, and those elders in Jerusalem. And they were the ones in charge of the religious and the social life of the first century Judea. And the Sanhedrin, they believed that Jesus was a fake Messiah. So if he was a fake Messiah, his gospel was a fake news. And they were so threatened by Jesus' teachings and actions, especially that of the cleansing of the temple. Remember that uh, episode in, in a context? And so after the cleansing of the temple, all the more, they were seeking a way to put Jesus to death. And so they felt that their authority was undermined by Jesus. And so when they had this encounter in the temple, what did they ask Jesus? This is what they asked Jesus. Verse 28, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you authority to do this? You see, they knew Jesus did not study under any of their theology teachers. And Jesus was never authorized by the Sanhedrin to do all of this ministry. But instead of giving a plain answer, Jesus answered their question with a counter question. And by doing this, Jesus was actually showing them who was in charge. Look what, what Jesus said. I will ask you one question. Answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. What a brilliant counter questioning. And so the ball is now in the Sanhedrin's hand. Mark records, and they discussed it among themselves with one another saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why didn't you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John was really a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know, liar, we don't know. And Jesus said to them, 
neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So somehow there was a stalemate there. But what's wrong with the answers and attitudes of the Sanhedrin here? The Sanhedrin's answers reveal that their problem was not just their unbelief. Their problem was that they consider their position and authority more important than their convictions. Wow. They look at their position and authority more important than their convictions. It would be very difficult for people like that to deny themselves and follow Jesus. Very difficult, but not necessarily impossible. They would rather hold on to their power, their, their status in the community, than humbling and submitting to the authority of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now friends, do we have any problems accepting and submitting to Christ's authority over all things? I hope not. I hope not. We know where his authority came from. We know it came from God the Father in heaven. But in our present world, right now, there are thousands, if not millions of people who do not believe, they do not submit to the authority of Jesus. They question his authority. They don't see him as someone they should pledge allegiance to. And some of them literally hate Jesus for demanding utmost loyalty and obedience. We know they're mistaken. One day, they will see. Because every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But for now, they are not submissive. They don't like to submit to accept his authority over their lives. But for Living Word Church, that's not the case, right? I hope it's not the case. I choose to believe that you are a faith community that humbly accepts, that humbly submits to the authority of God in Jesus Christ, not just in the area of salvation, but also in living the Christian life on a daily basis. I said, not just in the area of salvation, because you say, Jesus said he is the Savior, so we submit to him. Okay, Lord, you are the Savior. I submit to you. I believe in you. I repent of my sins, and you are my Savior. You are my Lord. That's in the area of the salvation. But not only in the area of salvation, we also submit to him in the area of living the Christian life on a daily basis. We're saying to him, Lord, you are truly my Lord every single day of my life. You see, what are the implications if we as a church truly accept and submit to Christ's authority? Let me just share two very important implications here. First, we deny ourselves and live as His bond servants. That's what's going to happen. If we truly accept and submit to Christ's authority, we deny ourselves and we say, Lord, we are your bond servants. Denying ourselves means we are willing to let go of our selfish personal ambitions and we pursue His agenda for our lives and for the world. It means we're seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness. It means desiring that His will be done on earth, in my life here on earth, in my marriage, in my business, in my studies, as it is perfectly done in heaven. Christ's desires become your desires. Christ becomes the preeminent in your life. That's self-denial and living as his bond servant. The second implication when we truly accept and submit to Christ's authority is reflected when we faithfully obey the Great Commission. And some call this the Great Consumition because they don't like to do it. But not for a humble, submissive, and loyal disciple of Christ. If you look at the context of the Great Commission, it was given by one who has ultimate authority in heaven and on earth. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18. All authority, not just some, not just some, not just 50%, not 99.9. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything 
all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so the ones who have faith in God will always say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes to the Great Commission, yes to obeying God's will, yes to fully submitting to Christ's authority. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Unlike the Sanhedrin, we don't care. You are not the authority. But for us, Lord Jesus, you are my ultimate authority and I submit to you, I bow down to you, I say yes to your will. So, as I close, let us now move to a reflection mode here. Brothers and sisters, we should not take this message lightly. Can you say now that you have this kind of faith that Jesus commands in this passage? Do we have this unwavering faith that trusts God to accomplish what is humanly impossible? Do we have this faith that obeys God's policy on forgiveness? And do we have this kind of faith that fully accepts and submits to God's authority in your life? If you want more concrete examples of men and women who had faith in God, read and meditate on Hebrews 11. There you will find how the Lord did the impossible in and through these people who had faith in God. And you would see how they responded to those who sinned against them, who persecuted them, who treated them unjustly. But at the same time, you would also see how these people submitted to God's authority in their lives, even if it led them to suffering and death. Hebrews 11. As the Lord Jesus is looking at Living Word IT Park Church right now, he's doing that right now. He's looking at this church. May he see men and women, young and old alike, fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, as members of this faith community. May he see every one of you having this genuine faith in God. As so Jesus sees you, may he say, this is a church that truly pleases me in every way. Because this is a church that has faith in God. May the Lord bless this sermon today. May he be glorified and everybody edified with this sermon. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that in your Son, Jesus, we have salvation. We have forgiveness of sins. And in your Son, we truly can put our trust in you. Because you are the God who is powerful. God who is expert, an expert when it comes to what is humanly impossible. So Lord, whatever situations your people are in, that living what I take part, you know their specific situation as a church, corporately, and individually. I pray that you would strengthen their faith in you, their faith in what you can do in and through them. Lord, reveal specific vision, or if you have revealed that already, give them that faith to believe. Despite how big the vision is, it can be accomplished, it can be achieved, because your power is working in and through them. Lord, those who are struggling in their marriage and in many circumstances that are just so impossible for them at this point to be solved, give them that faith to believe that you are capable of helping and accomplishing what is humanly impossible. I pray that you would strengthen each one. There are people there who have 
grudges in their hearts and they have not released that person yet and have forgiven others. I pray for the grace and the power to give them, give them that grace and power so that they can release that forgiveness to others. And I pray that all of us will be submissive to your will, to your authority over our lives every single day. Lord, thank you for this message today. We glorify you and we want everyone to be built up. In the mighty name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So good morning, brothers and sisters.